I will, I will use all the verses of Psalms 51. Are you happy? In, in these last days, we are advised to read more the Word of God. So even in preaching, I want more uh, text to be read, uh, scriptures to be read. Hallelujah. It's better. Okay. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Hallelujah. Bless this word again, Lord, to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please take your seats. Our topic this morning is about forgiveness. Not, you, not about you forgiving someone else, but about you and me, all of us, receiving forgiveness from God. It, I should have titled this, Forgive Me, Lord, something like that. Because it, it is about the transaction between God, the Almighty One, the Creator One, and man, the frail, weak creature. We are creatures of God, and we are so weak, even from the start. And even after we are born again, after you have served the Lord for many years, and I know this from the records I have in, among the pastors and ministers, and I know this also among the Christians I know, uh, sometimes veteran members of the church. They have served God at one time in the past. And then an event took place in their life and they fall. So forgiveness about encountering God after the fall. Is that possible? Is it possible after a saint like you or me, a believer like you and me, fall into a sin or, or moral failure, for example? Is it possible for us to have an encounter with God once more and not only renew our relationship with God but progress higher than we, we were before. Is that possible? Well, we read Psalm 51. This is the Psalm of Repentance of King David. Do you know the story of King David? David is one of the most referenced person in the Old Testament, even in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, 66 chapters of the Bible was talking about this boy who was a shepherd and became a king, became a champion, a zero becoming a hero. And that the, the progress of David was really an, a, a story of anointing. He was anointed by God. He was chosen by God. He, he was taken from, from nothing, in fact. He was the youngest of the children of Jesse, a, a Bethlehemite. And, and then he was, he was belittled by his brothers. And then uh, God looked at his heart. Hallelujah. And God saw something in the heart of David. David, from being a shepherd... He was also a worshiper. He became a worshiper. He, he grew up as a worshiper in, in watching his sheep. He became 
famous as the sweet singer of Israel. Hallelujah. That is the reason why we have plenty of songs in the book of Psalms. The hundred plus Psalms, majority of that was written by this young boy who was a singer of Israel. He was so talented in singing because that's what you get if you are alone. Watching your sheep and through the night you will be there. You are in communion with God. It's very easy to commune with God. He would look at the stars and he would say, The heavens declare the glory of our God. And he would watch his sheep as he watched his sheep and he would write, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack anything. He was a very creative man. And he had that because the Bible says he is a man after God's own heart. He, is, he, was a, he, was, he became famous by the encounter he had as a boy with a giant of Gath named Goliath. After 40 days of watching each other, there was no fighting. It, there was a war. And Goliath would stand up, insult the people of Israel, insult the God of Israel. And nobody was accepting the challenge of Goliath. And this little boy was sent to bring some, some lunch for his brothers who were part of the soul, uh, military of King Saul. And he heard Goliath. And he was moved in his heart. He said, who is this uncircumcised Philistines who, who will insult the army of the living God? What will be the reward for, for the person who, who can kill this, this champion? And he was told the reward would be no taxes for your family. And then uh, you will get the daughter of the king to be your wife. <clears throat> so David, the young boy said, I'll fight him. And of course, everybody don't believe. Even his own brothers insulted him. The king asked him, uh, can you really fight this this Goliath, this champion, you will represent the entire army of Israel. Can you be our champion? Can you defeat this giant? You are not a trained soldier. You are a shepherd. This giant has been a, a uh, martial artist from childhood. He trained to fight war. Can you defeat him? David just smiled and said, Well, if defeating is the subject, I have faced lions and bears who tried to steal my sheep. A lion came and I held the mouth of the lion and I broke it. A bear came to take my lamb and I held the bear and I <laughs> break his, his head on, on, on the ground. I will defeat this giant as I defeated the lion and the bear, the Lord helping me. I will feed his flesh to the birds. That's the confidence of this young man. And you know the rest of the story. Just one smooth stone. The giant was killed and all the Philistines ran because the, the, the deal is if they are defeated, they'll become slaves to the Israelites. And so songs and jingles were composed for, king, for, for David. He was not yet a king. He's a little boy. They said... Uh, Saul king a thousand, but David killed ten thousand. He became famous in an instant. He became friend with the son of, of, of King Saul, Jonathan. They became close friends. And, you know, King Saul disobeyed God. And uh, so David actually, according to the story, was chosen. He was anointed by the prophet uh, and, and then uh, he was announced that he is the anointed one that will replace King Saul. So King Saul wanted to kill him. And because of this anger and the, and the guilt maybe, in the heart of King Saul, he became like this. He became crazy and insane. He became demon-possessed. But the Bible says that uh, the Holy Spirit left Saul and demons would come into this king. And the only one that can come down the spirit and the demons in in King, in King Saul was the music of David. David would come in and the music will shoot down the devil. You know, the devil comes down when you sing. Praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> so, the story goes that as 
David progressed in the Lord. He won plenty of battles. Eventually, he became king of Israel, famous as a king. He, the Bible says that when he united the whole uh, Israel tribes, the whole tribes of Israel, that the nations around Israel was fearful of him. That's how famous he was. The nations around, the, the Canaanites and all kinds of Jebusites and, and the Kirisites and all kinds of sites and the parasites were afraid of him. And so one time, there was this war and all the soldiers were facing the battle. They were fighting. King David became tired one day and decided to go home and have a little vacation. So all the other soldiers were fighting there. David went home with some bodyguards. And he went on top of his palace. And he was looking and enjoying the scenery. And lo and behold, he saw a woman taking a bath. The name of that woman was Bathsheba. Married woman, but very beautiful. Married to a, one of his soldiers, Uriah. And he, for, he, he, he called for that woman to sleep with him. In the process of time, Bathsheba became pregnant. So David now has to cover that up. It will be a scandal. So David said, okay. Uh, before this becomes a scandal, call Uriah home from war. And so they called Uriah from war. Uriah, Uriah went home. He, he faced the king. The king said, all right, uh, we, we want to give you a, a bonus for your being a soldier. You're a, a bold soldier. Sleep with your wife tonight. Have a relax, you know, relax. But Uriah was a devoted soldier who loved the Lord and who loved his brothers who are fighting the war. He did not come home to sleep with his wife. He just stayed there outside the palace. And so, kalot kalot si David. Problem. So he called his bodyguard. He said, okay, bring Uriah back to the battle. But be sure, put him in front of the cannon, so to speak. Make sure that he will die in the battle. David, after adultery, tried to cover the adultery by conspiring to commit murder. That is the story and background of Isaiah 51. David committed adultery and conspired murder. And he was trying to hide it for a while. But God, who looks down from heaven, can see what was wrong in the life of David. And so, God sent a prophet named Nathan and according to the title of Psalm 51, Nathan confronted David. And in the confrontation, first, first, David was forced to speak out his ideal justice. When Nathan told him a story, there was this rich man, had a visitor, and he has to feed the visitor. So, but instead of killing his own sheep or lambs to feed the visitor, he stole the the lamb of the neighbor. The only lamb of the neighbor, he stole it. And that was the one they cooked to feed their visitor. David was listening and became angry. Kung sa ilunggo pa, nagpalamula siya, nag-aso ang, ang uh, lawas niya sa kaakig. And he said, that man should die. Nathan then said, you are that man. You are the man. Because God has blessed you, picked you up from nothing, and made you into someone, someone famous, and gave you all the blessings. You have wives, you have children, you have wealth. God has given you so much blessing. And then you did this to Uriah. You killed Uriah, you took his wife. And David immediately said, I was wrong. He repented. And part of that repentance... I think God led him to write this psalm. How many of you would like to repent and write your words of repentance as part of the scripture? <laughs> so this is an intentional scripture for everyone who belongs to God. We will not talk about those who do not know God. 
those who are not Christians. We will talk about Christians who need the forgiveness of God. David obviously was forgiven by God. Was given a second chance. He was promoted again. In fact, Jesus Christ is so attached with David. In the New Testament, when they call the Messiah, they, they call him Jesus, the son of David from Bethlehem. Hallelujah. Amen. And, and, and David was not cut off. David was not put to shame. His name was not deleted from the, from the book of life. He was restored. And that is why whatever lesson we can get from Psalms 51 can be applied to us. Can be applied to you. Amen? Don't tell me that after you became a Christian and, and you have served the Lord and you are baptized in water, you attend church, you pay your tithes, and you have been so good that you have no chance to fall into sin. That is not the truth. Let me read to you before I proceed. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 to 9. This is the message, 1 John in the New Testament. This is the message we have heard from Him and proclaim to you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, which most of us are in the habit of saying after we are confronted, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. There you are. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Cleansing. Forgiveness, praise God. Amen? So, there is a remedy. That is why later on, King David wrote this as well. Psalms 103. You remember this psalm? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, verse 2. And forget not all His benefits. And then he listed all the benefits. The first benefit he mentioned was He forgave all our sins. The first benefit that we need to celebrate about should be the forgiveness of our sins. That's the first benefit we need to care about. That benefit should never, never be forgotten. That benefit should touch our hearts all the time. When I remember how God sent His Son to die for me so that He can forgive me, I will never forget that. Amen? And then Psalms 37, verse 23 to 24. Psalms 27, 23 to 24. The steps of a man. Other translation says, the steps of a good man are ordered, are established by the Lord. When he delights in his way, though he fall. Listen, the steps of a man who delights in the way of the Lord. And the Lord delights in him. Praise God. Amen? Amen? That, does that sound like you? Does that sound like you and me? Hallelujah. The steps of a man or woman are established by the Lord. He is guiding you. Guiding your steps. When he delights in his way, though he fall, that my brothers and sisters, is a great possibility. Though he fall, he shall not be cast headlong, for the Lord upholds his hands. Verse 
You know, once you surrender your heart to Jesus, your life to Jesus, once you have made that conversion experience and the conversion uh, uh, path that you walk on that path, the Lord will direct your step. Maybe not perfectly at the start. There is a falling. Amen? But you will not be cast out forever. You will not be cast out headlong. That means you will not be cut off and die. You will not be cast out headlong. The Lord will uphold you by His hands. How many of you have already experienced that in the past? You backslid, you sp spoke evil of the Lord, or maybe you did something bad, and you are so convicted, and it seems like you can, yeah, there's no way to come back to God. But God held you in, again in, in your own hands and lift you up. Praise God. King David. How many of us can compare ourselves with this boy who became famous and became king of Israel? No one. He is already famous. He is anointed. He is a man after God's own heart. And yet he fell. And that is why we cannot be proud about where we stand. God, however, wants to encourage us that He has provided a way for us so that we can be revived. We can be fixed. We can be restored. Hallelujah! Amen? Amen? So, let's talk first of all about being or getting real with God. Verses 1 to 6. The, the verses that we read. The verses that we read reveals to us truth about God and truth about ourselves. Because this is a transaction between God and us. So let's, let's learn first about what it says, verses 1 to 6, about God. Okay? Number one, uh, truth about God. According to these verses, number one, that God is merciful. Say the word, merciful. In verse 1 and 2, it says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. See, the mercy of God flows from His nature being love. And the love of God has in it what they call kindness. That's why they call it loving kindness. The love of God is kind even to sinners. Amen. Loving kindness. It says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. That's the appeal of David as he starts this psalm. He pointed out the abundance of the mercy of God and that the love of God is steadfast. Loving kindness or devotion, loving devotion. One translation says the loving devotion of God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And His mercy is abundant. According, one translation says, according to the multitudes of your mercy. That's the only translation they can make. But what that means is that the mercy of God always overflow. Wala gatigi tigi ang gino sa iyang mercy. Wala siya nagakuripot sa iyang mercy. It is always abundant mercy. Hallelujah! Come on! Come on! When He forgives, He forgives you more and more and more. Praise God! He is so merciful. Nobody in the entire story of the Bible who came to God with all their plenty of sins, has been ignored or rejected. The mercy of God is plentiful. The mercy of God is abundant. Praise the Lord. Number two, God is not only merciful, but He is sovereign. That word sovereign means that He is above all. How many of you recognize that God is above all? He is above all. Because He is above all, He is not accountable to anyone. No 
nobody will run after God and say, God, you are wrong. No, He is above all. He is sovereign. He is above all. He is not accountable to anyone. In Psalms 51 verse 3, listen to this. David said, I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. That is one translation. Another translation says, I acknowledge my transgressions. I acknowledge my transgression. Why? What, what does that mean? That means that a sinner like you and me, like King David, is accountable to someone else. God is not accountable to anyone, but we are accountable to someone else. That someone else is the Lord. Hallelujah. We will acknowledge to Him our sin. How did you feel long time ago when you were not yet a Christian? Going to a confessional booth and talking to a priest who is only a human being and talk to him about your sin. You are not accountable to him. You are accountable to God. That is why the Bible says, confess your sins to God. Palapakan natin atun Lord. He is sovereign. And He convicts you until you admit your sin. I know that by experience, and I know that when, when I talk to people, sometimes people will, will not immediately admit their, or acknowledge their sin before God. But eventually, they will. Not because you force them to, but because God was at work in their hearts. God is so sovereign. He is so powerful. You cannot run away from Him. The one we sin against is the Lord. Only one that we are accountable to. Psalms 51 verse 4. Come on, read it. We are, we are interpreting it verse by verse. Verse 4 says, Against you, you only, have I sinned. And done what is evil in your sight. So that you may be justified in your words. Justified in what you say, and blameless in your judgment. David recognizes that eventually our sin is only accounted by only one. Amen? Sometimes your friend will talk to you about your sin. <laughs> eventually they may even forget. Your wife or your husband or your, your close friends will talk to you about your sin and, and, and try to purge it out again from you. They cannot do anything about your sin. But God, hallelujah, God knows. And that, that is why Bisan nga, King David committed a sin. It has affected his family, I believe. It has affected his kingdom. It has affected the family of Bathsheba. It has affected the, the son of Bathsheba, which eventually died. It has affected the future of King David. But he uh, is not accountable to people who were affected by his sin. He was only accountable eventually to just one, the sovereign one, to God. And sometimes people can be easy on your sin. They will forgive you immediately. But how about God? You know, people came to me just last, this week because he did something, he said something wrong. And I wrote to him how, how rash he is, and lack of patience. And, and I said, why would you say something like that, adversarial statement, something like that? And so he, he asked for, for forgiveness. He said, I apologize. You are right. I, I, I was rushed and I am impatient. You are right. But I did not answer because I thought I'll give him a silent treatment. <laughs> so I did, not, I did not answer. And then he manipulated me by more messages. You know the story that Jesus wrote, said in the Bible? You should forgive your brother 70, 70 times 7. He was trying to to force me and manipulate me to forgive him. And then uh, the other day, he, he told the story that he said, I was driving and I was in a rush and I hit this, this motorbike with a driver and his wife who is pregnant. It's good that they were not harmed. And I asked uh, sorry for them, uh, for, for what I did because I was in a rush and they forgave me. And then he said, Brother Ray, can you also forgive me? This man is trying to manipulate me with his words. Now, he knows my stand. Here's my stand. 
I can easily forgive people. But when I forgive people, I, it has no power to change them. They must ask forgiveness from the sovereign Lord eventually and between Him and the Lord. And when that is corrected, praise God. Amen? If your wife forgives you, unless you decide to change, His forgiveness of you cannot, cannot change you. You really have to deal it with God. You have to, be, to stand alone with God, who is the sovereign one. That is what David is saying. He is saying, oh, to you and only you have I sinned. He said, look at this verse, in verse 4. I have done what is evil in your sight. Do you know that sin is evil in his sight? Sometimes sin is not evil in our sight. It's not evil, it's pleasurable. But in the sight of God, it is evil. Telling lies, you know, taking advantage of others, harming others, hurting others. You think, you think it is not evil? In the sight of God, it is evil. That is why we say He is sovereign. He is a good judge because in His sight, what is white is white, what is black is black, what is evil is evil. There is no color in sin. Not white lies, no white sin, nothing like that. He is sovereign. Number, number three, God is just. God is just. We already mentioned, to him sin is evil in his sight. Uh, David said, it is only to you that I have seen these things so that you will be justified when you speak. How many of you know that when God speaks between you and Him, sometimes you argue that God is wrong and you are right. David said, no, 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 Lord. You are always just. You, are, you have the right to, to say these things. And what you say is right. What you say is fair. What you say is just. You will be justified when you speak. That means, Lord, by your words, when you say something, you will always be proven right. How many of you are always proven right? Now only the Lord is justified when He speaks. And then, yet you will be blameless in your judgment. That's found in verse 4. Blameless, that means there is no error in His judgment. When He be, begin to, to separate the, the, the sheep from the goat, He is fair and He is correct. He, you cannot blame him. He is out of blame. He is free of blame. But he is just. Let's go to number four. He is true. Verse six says, Behold, you delight in truth, in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Do you know that in the eyes of God, every one of us is transparent? He can see through. We are naked before Him according to Hebrews chapter 4. We are standing naked before Him. He, is, he delights in the truth in the inward being. That's why I believe David immediately said, I was wrong. I did evil. Lord, forgive. Be merciful to me. Why? Because he knew that God delights in truth in the inward being. Truth is always in the heart. Sometimes the mouth cannot speak the truth. The truth is always in the heart. In the secret heart, it says. In other words, God detects hidden things in the heart. He teaches us the wisdom that it is wise to be truthful and transparent, not hiding things from Him. It is not wise to hide things from God. Not wise at all. Not wise at all. Proverbs 21, 2 to 3. Every way of man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs his heart, weighs the heart. In the eyes of every man, what he does is right, but the Lord is the one who weighs the heart. Verse 3. To do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. When we commit sin, we tend to do religious things. 
gave offering, gave sacrifice, joined SOS, all kinds of things, trying to cover for our mistake. That is not acceptable according to this verse. Proverbs 21, verse 3. To do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than your religious sacrifice. Doing it right is much, much better. Amen? Let's go to the truth about man. What, what does it say about man? You or me? The truth about me. Let's just say. Number one, I'm a sinner. Hello? Hello? I am a forgiven sinner. Amen. I'm a sinner forgiven by God. Born to it according to verse 5. Read verse 5 again. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Everyone was born in sin. Hello? There is only one person in the entire history of mankind who was born sinless. He was born of a virgin. His name is Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus is the only one born sinless, conceived without sin. It does not prefer to marry. It's about Jesus. Amen? But every one of us, we are sinner. What that means is that by nature, we were born into this world with a moral defect. Kung baga sa produkto, may factory defect kita. We have a spiritually damaged uh, character when we came into this world. We were spiritually damaged. You look at a young baby. We have two grandchildren here working with us. Very, very cute. They are always cute. You know, babies are always cute. I take all their pictures. I am so proud about their pictures. But now that they are starting to grow and noticing what they like and what they don't like, I notice something more. The shade of, of the old nature and the fleshly nature begins to appear. That's not only true about my grandchildren. It is true about you, all of you. We were morally damaged. That is why even a child needs to have, hallelujah, Jesus in their life. Now, how about sinful? Why, why, why did I say we are sinners and then sinful? Sinful is just the term we use because the nature of sin started to progress. We progressed in sinning. Just like when you were small, you were kindergarten in your sinning, in your telling a lie. And then high school, high, high school lying is different. And then when you reach high school, you learn to, to take money from your daddy or mommy's pocket. Right, right, hello? We improve in our sinning and telling lies. We are improving and improving. We have proven ourselves not only to be sinners, but sinful. We are active in committing sin. David used three important words to describe what he did. Look at these verses. Three important words. Number one, transgression. He used transgression several times there even in those verses. Transgression means rebellion against God, rebellion against His authority, rebellion against His law. Look at this little child. He crawls, he's cute. Now he begins to run. The daddy keeps on saying, no, not there. No, don't get that. Don't. And he begins to say, no, 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 no. But the child begins to rebel against the authority. Transgression is like that. David committed transgression. He, he ignored the authority of God and the law of God. Another word, iniquity. Iniquity is a distortion of what should be. Distortion of good things. Iniquity means crooked behavior. How many of us can hide from that fact? We have crooked behavior. We learned how to be crooked in our life. So he used that as well. And then sin. Sin means fallen short. 
you miss the mark. If the mark or the target is here, your, your arrow just hit here. We did not hit the mark. We did not fulfill the purpose of God for our lives. We did not do the will of God. We miss it. That is the meaning of sin. Sin is fallen short. That's why the Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Three important things to describe being sinful. And we understand that. We rebel, we, we distorted things, and then we miss the mark. We did not follow God. We did not obey the purpose of God for our life. And number three, which is also true about us, needy. Man is needy. Amen? Without God, we are lost and corrupt. We are controlled by sin nature. David said, my sin is ever before me. It's always trying to entice you and tempt you. We need the mercy of God. We are guilty by as charged. We need thorough washing and cleansing. Hallelujah. Amen. We are needy. We need God. So, how do we go through this? To get right with God. How do we do that? Let me show you, because I have preached from this uh, chapter many, many times. But let me show you what I can summarize as the desires, the desires of a repentant heart. If a man is truly repentant, his repentance is true. In other words, he has these four important desires as he goes to God. That is his motivation. Why do you want forgiveness from God? Why? The answer to that is, because there are desires there. Desires there that are pictured in these verses. Let me give you four important desires that you need to have in order to have an experience of an encounter of revival and renewal with God. Even after you have fallen into immorality or fallen into sin, these are the four important desires that God is looking. Have you... Have you do you remember that verse? Uh, delight yourself in the Lord. And then what? He will give you desires of your heart. Not, not what you desire, but He produces desires in your heart that are valid. Because we have plenty of invalid desires. Wicked desires. But He will give you desires of your heart. These are the four desires that God can produce in your heart and then you will discover it. It is there. Do you want to know? Okay, let's enumerate them. Number one, we discovered these desires because he mentioned it in his prayer. Number one, let's read this desire, number one. I want to live clean. I want to be clean. I want to live a clean life. That is in the desires of David. Let us read these verses, verse 7 and 9, and then 10. Okay? Purge me with hyssop. That word purge means purify me. Okay? Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Verse 9, hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. So you notice that he is not just asking to be made clean, but he wanted to have a renewed heart. Why is that? Because if you do not have a heart that has been renewed, you will always go back to sin. People ask for forgiveness, but they are not transformed. They are not changed. But David is correct. He said, I desire not only to have clean, white, snow heart. I want to have a new heart. 
I want to have a new spirit. Create in me a new heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Those expression is telling us that the desire of David is not just forgiveness. His desire is transformation. His desire is change. You know this when you deal with your children. Mommy, hindi na ko magliwat. Please forgive me. So, you being like maybe Mother God or Father God being forgiving, so you forgive. The following week, he did the same. Your conclusion is, this boy, this girl, is not sincere in his being sorry. He's just playing around, delaying the time. He continues to do the same evil things. No desire to live clean. No desire to cut off from sin. We want to be true repentant before God. We are saying to Him, I want to live clean. You know, hisap is a very special word in the Bible. That word hisap. The first time that word was used was in the book of Exodus. First time. Uh, the Lord told Moses, okay, this is the night when you will escape. Kill a lamb. Its house will kill a lamb. And then collect the blood of the lamb. Bring the blood there in front of your house at the door. Take a branch of a tree, a bitter tree uh, uh, or plant, hyssop. That's the name of the plant. Take that, that, that branch and uh, sow, sow that in the blood and sprinkle the blood on the doorpost and lentils of your, of your door, of your house. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. That's where they get the word Passover. Do you know that Jesus is the lamb, the Passover lamb of God? Hello? David used that because he remembers that hyssop is being used and he understood when that hyssop is being used to sprinkle the, do the door, that household is being purified under the protection of God. He, he is making them pure. And we can apply this principle to the Christian experience of having Jesus. Only the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. I want to live clean. I want to have a right application of forgiveness and cleansing in my own heart. Verse 9. Hide your face from my sin. Blot out all my iniquities. Hide your face from my sin. He is not saying, I will hide my sin from your face. No, he said, hide your face from my sin. Hide your face from my sin, Lord. Don't look at my sin. You are so holy to look at my ugly, dirty heart. Make my heart clean. Purge me. Remove the undesirable things. Purify me. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Let's go to number two. So that's the first desire. I desire to live clean. I have to come to God for forgiveness. Amen. Here's number two. I want to rejoice again. Now tell me. Show me a person who has obviously by, by willfulness, by foolishness, by type of insanity, try to sin against a holy God. What happens for, uh, uh, instantly is he lost his joy. Nobody who has broken the heart of God would rejoice and like, you know, I'm so happy I sin against God. You lose the joy. So, the first thing you, you, will, you will desire when you go to God for forgiveness is, Lord, I miss that joy. I want that joy to be revived in my own heart. Verse 8, okay? Verse 8, let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Those are good pictures. God has broken the backbones of people who have sinned against God. And it's not comfortable to have broken bones. 
That is the picture there. You know, I, I have been preaching for four Sundays on, on, on barefoot. I cannot wear my shoes. Why? Because I have an in-ground toenail that is so sharp it, it embedded in the flesh of my big toe. And then everybody in the house running around, children, and they always step on this big toe. And so it bled for many, many times throughout these four weeks. It's painful. God says, okay, I will break your bones. Nakasala ako, Lord, you will break my bones. Amo nang complain ni David. He is saying, it's like you broke my bones, Lord. You know why? Let me give you the reason. And it's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. When God wants to forgive us, okay, He sends to us what the Bible calls, what St. Paul calls, godly sorrow. He sends godly sorrow. It is like the sorrow where you cannot anymore do anything. You cannot dance and, and please God. You are not anymore pleasing before God. You are so sorry inside and there is no more joy. The joy of salvation is gone. It's lost. The sound of rejoicing is not anymore in your mouth, in your lips, in your heart. But that is not bad according to Paul. Paul said, I wrote you a letter and it grieved you. You became sorrowful. I regret. But after a while, I said, it's good for you. Because then he explained this. He said, godly sorrow leads to repentance. Godly sorrow leads to repentance. Muna nga nang notaran ko, basta masinulubo na ang tao, may natabo, gini mo. Hindi na siya malipa yun, yung palagyo na siya, may natabo, gini. Jonah, he failed God. You know what Jonah did? Siling sa mga taga-barko, nga ginsakyan niya, yeah, who is this? Di mahalas ka nakasakay di sa aton. Nag-ako siya. Kaya nakapal siya sa gabot-gabot. And the captain said, what will we do with you? Jonah said, just throw me in the water, then you will be saved. God sent him to Nineveh to save those people. Now he is wanting to save the, 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 the people in the boat by his, himself dying. He wants to commit suicide in the sea so that the people in the boat will be saved. You know the insanity of people? They are not happy. Jonah was never happy when he was running away from God. So that is why. One of the things you need to decide if you want to go back to God is, I want to rejoice again. Verse 12, restore to me the joy of salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Praise God. Amen? Nagulan. And I like the sound of the rain because pwede ko kapalawig hasta las otso. Listen, my brothers and sisters, kung wala lang gani, bisan hindi ka mo Christian, bangkuton ka mo, what is your number one ambition in life? I want happiness. Ginsorbi na sa bilong kalibutan. Happiness is number one goal of people, whether they are Christian or not Christian. But most of all, Christian, because happiness is only available, true happiness is only available to Christians. Other people have very shallow understanding of happiness. And now, if you are a Christian, and then you made, you made something bad, you, you did something wrong, you lost the joy of salvation, you even doubt Am I still saved? If Jesus comes today, will I join them in the rapture? You lost confidence. You lost hope. Most of all, you lost your happiness. However, as a repentant sinner, you go to God and say, Lord, restore to me the joy of my salvation. I want to be happy again. Take away the sorrow and the pain. Because of my sin. 
I now understand. It makes sense. Thank you, God, for making me sorrowful. I was able to fast. I was able to kneel down. I was able to regret things that I have done in the past. And I was able to be so convicted. I said to myself, I will never go back to that pit of sin again. I'm done. I'm done. Uphold me with a willing spirit. You know that word? Uphold means keep me alive. Hallelujah. Let me be alive again. Let me be happy again. Let's go to number three. The desire number three of David as a repentant sinner is I want to worship God right. I want to worship right. Not all worships are right. There are false worship. There are wrong worship. There are uh, idolatrous worship. God is not pleased with those worship. There are Christian worship. God is not pleased. You know why? Because they worship the Lord with their lips, but their heart is far away from God. They are not singing songs from their hearts. They are singing songs from their head. To worship right. Let me give you the verses. Verse 11, it says, Cast me not away from your presence. And don't take away your Holy Spirit. How many of you enjoy the presence of God? Raise your hand. How many of you receive the comfort of the Holy Spirit? Raise your hand. See, He is called Comforter. The real comfort you can get from God is through the Holy Spirit. I can testify to you. Man will write to you comforting words. They greet you in the Facebook, you know. They appreciate you, those things. and They, they send you, you the normal ritualistic uh, emoji and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't really give you the, the real appreciation and joy. No. Holy Spirit, when He comes, He will say, I know how you feel. Let me tell you how to get it back. Amen? The Holy Spirit was sent so that we will glorify Jesus. Holy Spirit was sent so that we will be guided in our life as many as are led by the Spirit of God. They are sons of God. So I want to worship God in a right way. Verse 14, 17. We are just reading this. Deliver me from blood guiltiness. You know what that means? Lord, set me free from being guilty of murdering Uriah. Something like that. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. O God of my salvation. And my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. Do you know that if you are free from guilt, you begin to shout, Hallelujah! You begin to say, Hosanna to the King of Kings. Oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. Bisan baka pa daw, anong sunugon kong offering. You will not be pleased. But the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. You know, broken spirit, we spoke about godly sorrow. A broken spirit is because you admitted to God that you are broken inside. Contrite means humble. A broken spirit and a humble heart, God will not despise. You go to God and say, Lord, I want to worship you, right? But I have been, I have been <laughs> distorted. I, I, have, I have messed up my life. How can I worship you in the right way? God says, I will make you clear. I will accept you if you have a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Hallelujah. Would you say amen? Verse 19. Then will you delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. That's the last verse. It means that 
if this happens, O Lord, that I am delivered from my guiltiness, from my guilt, I am forgiven, uh, my, my worship will progress. Not only individually will I worship you, I'll bring other people to worship you. Hallelujah. Zion will worship you. And instead of little birds, they will serve you. They will give you a sacrifice of bulls. The lago, gijaya nga, nga, nga symbol of worship ang hiatag sa imo. That is what is meant. I want to worship right. It is bad enough to worship God carrying sin in our hearts. Many verses in the Bible. But let's go to the last because I don't want to keep you. Last. A repentant heart has this desire. Let's read. I want to serve the Lord. Verse 13. I, I want to serve the Lord. It says, Then, if these things happen to me, I am purged, I am made clean, I am washed, I have been restored, then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. That's a desire. Do you know that if sin retained is retained in our heart, we are not qualified to serve the Lord? We are not qualified. There's a man named Simon Demagus in Acts chapter 8. He saw Peter and John doing ministry. Lay hands on people. People receive the Holy Spirit. And Simon said, I'll give you money. Give me the power so that when I lay hands on people, they will also receive the Holy Spirit. Simon, ngasangay niya nga si Peter, said, your money perish with you because you thought you can buy the gifts of God with your money. You have no share in this ministry because your heart is not right with God. Anybody in sin whose heart is not right with God is not qualified to serve the Lord. King Saul was disqualified because he disobeyed the Lord and he consulted with, with witchcraft and sorcery and he disobeyed the rules of God and he was discarded. He was rejected. David was accepted because after this, you know after this, prayer, David was forgiven. He suffered the consequence of that sin. But after that, it is like he was restored. He was forgiven. He progressed in his life until he, was, he wanted to build the temple. God said, okay, it's good you thought about that, but I will not allow you to build the temple because your hands are filled with blood in the war. Commission Solomon, your son, to build the temple for me. In, in other words, David was given another chance. Amen? The, the steps of a good man are established by the Lord. Hallelujah. And even when he falls, he will rise up again. Because God will uphold him with his hand. This hand, hallelujah, is the hand of forgiveness. The hand of restoration, praise God. So as we close, this is the summary. I wrote this down. I understand this may, may not be complete. But when we fall, this is what God does. Number one, he confronts us. He may send Prophet Nathan. He may send Pastor Ray. He may send your child. He may send your wife or your spouse or your husband. He may send your daddy or your mommy to confront you. But he confronts us. Hallelujah. We cannot run away. Number two, he convicts us. Convict means to convince us that we are wrong and God is right. Number three, he comforts us. Hallelujah. He comforts us and he will say to us, I'll give you another chance. There is a way. I will make a way for you. He comforts us with the Holy Spirit. And then, part of that process, He covers you. You know the covering of the Christian? is Jesus. Jesus is our covering. The blood of Jesus will cover us, praise God. When God looks at us, He cannot see anymore the sin. He can only see one, the person of Jesus. He covers us. Number Next, He converts us. He changes us. Amen? How many of you are willing to be forgiven and converted? He will change us. Number next, He communes with us. He becomes closer to us and intimate with us. Just like Jesus. He knocks at the door of a sinful church. 
Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice, open the door, I will come in and we will have communion again. I will eat with you and you will eat with me, praise God. And then lastly, he commissions us, meaning he gives us another chance to serve him. He commands us once more. Yes, Lord, thank you, Lord, for trusting me once more. Thank you, Lord, for allowing me to serve you once more. Praise God. Amen. This completes my presentation to you about forgiveness. It's a transaction between God and man. In the area where man sinned against him. So, let us all stand. And be reminded of First John chapter one, verse nine. If we confess our sins, if we confess our sins to Him, to God, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. From all unrighteousness. Amen. Amen? Don't, don't respond to, the, to this message by saying, but I am not a, an adulterer like David. I did not say that. Maybe you sinned in a different way. Maybe you are thinking about the size of your sin. It's just small. In your eyes, it may be small. But have you consulted with God? Have you asked God? Di nagalin ang dalag ko? Di ba sa gamay? Little foxes, little foxes, the book of Proverbs spoils the whole vineyard. Your life is in danger. However, the Bible says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputes no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. This is David's testimony in Psalms 32. Isaiah 55, verse 6. Seek you the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. God is like that. The prodigal son of the prodigal, the prodigal son and the prodigal father in Luke chapter 15 is a good story of Jesus. There is forgiveness with God. You raise your hand and say, thank you, Lord. I am now remembering, I remember those sins I tried to hide. Nobody knows about it. It's secret. I tried to hide it. I tried even to forget it. But today, Lord, you made me realize there is no wisdom in trying to forget something that I need to confess. There is no wisdom in trying to hide. I, I will be deceiving myself if I do that. And the truth will not be in me. I love truth. I want to be transparently truth, truthful to God. I, I need real forgiveness. I, I don't want to give fake confession. Because fake confession will only give you a fake sense of forgiveness. Real confession means real forgiveness. If you are listening to this broadcast in the internet, because this will be posted in, in YouTube, you just do the same. Whatever it is you are trying to hide from God, reveal yourself to God. Come out from hiding and say to God, Lord, I, I don't want to hide anymore. I am a needy sinner. I have sinned against you. Forgive me, Lord. Cleanse me. Purge me with his sup. Make me white as snow. Renew a right spirit within me. 
and transform me from glory to glory. Hallelujah, Jesus. Let us sing this song and worship God. sinners and the Bible tells us that your gentleness makes us great will you accept that verse in your own heart the gentleness of God makes you great because he will not allow you to be broken beyond repair he is kung sa kapis nun pa ginahangayan niya ginikaw ya Because He loves you. He wants to repair whatever is wrong. Maybe, na sense mo nga victim ka, victimized ka. Maybe, ikaw nagpang victima. Maybe, you have some other people to blame, but you are a participant to a certain wickedness or sin. Whatever it is, the gentleness of God will make us great. The gentleness of God is expressed in mercy, in His grace, in His being faithful. His loving kindness is steadfast. His mercy is abundant. Hallelujah. I would never continue preaching if the mercy of God is so limited to only few people. Or only limited to those who are good ones. But the mercy of God is for every sinner. It does not matter, my friend. Take hold of that hand of God. You say to Him, Dear Lord, I need you. I need to walk straight. I don't want to be crooked. I don't want to have crooked behavior. I need, oh Lord, to live a clean life. I need to be rejoicing again. The joy of the Lord is my strength. I need, oh Lord, that I want to give the right worship, right worship to you. And I want to be of service to you once more. Hallelujah. That's my desire. That is why I want to be made clean. I want to be restored. I want to be renewed. Why? Because of these four major desires that David had and I also have in my own heart. I desire to live clean. Hallelujah. I desire to have a rejoicing again. And I desire to give you the right and proper worship that you deserve, dear Lord. And I want to serve you once more. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, when you go home tonight, you can continue meditating about this. Call on the name of the Lord. 
He is real. Even when we are together, He is real when you are there alone, when you go home. You talk to Him. Amen. Allow Him to minister to you. Will you do that? Raise your hands. Let me pronounce blessing upon you. Hallelujah. Raise your hands. Hallelujah. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord turn His face towards you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn His face to you, towards you, and give you peace. Hallelujah. Father in heaven, cover your people with protection from harm, from this storm, from COVID, from anything, and continue to make them strong from the inside. Hallelujah. We thank you for your presence and your promise today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Everyone said, Amen.